Hi folks, it's Andy and welcome to today's Kendall rant. Um, <coughs> it's going to be another little bit of a long one I think today. Um, because I know it's been a few days since I last posted one. I've been away actually um, over in, uh, in France, um, in Paris for a, a Kendall seminar uh, and grading. And uh, I'll talk about that a little bit more <laughs> uh, later on in the video. But first let's get through the questions uh, and then I can talk about that. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> first question is a bit of a long one, um, so bear with me while I read through it and then uh, let's get to an answer. So, um, <clears throat> hi Andy, I have a couple of uh, questions and comments. I was wondering if you could talk about how fantastic the Mengani cover is. Um, uh, I seriously love it, especially since uh, we have a lot of beginners using Club Shinai. Uh, it really helps prolong the life of the Shinai. Uh, I was wondering if you could also possibly stock the really thick men pads. Um, I'd love to just shop at Kendo Star and refer everyone to, uh, to shop there too. Um, but if they're asking for something specific, uh, I have to sometimes send them to four or more different sites uh, with half specific things that only that they only stock, and then it ends up costing a fortune in shipping. Um, I'd love to be able to buy Nakayui, uh, Kabuto style, Mengana cover, uh, red Sakigomu, Sakigomu, uh, undercoat, undercote gloves, um, chin pad. Uh, I'd personally uh, love the clear plastic, plastic tsuba uh, and a larger range of range of tsuba would be appreciated because everyone at club basically uses the same type of shinai and some of the beginners end up picking up someone else's uh, personal shinai instead of the club shinai and it's annoying to try and get everyone's stuff back off them uh, it's just a lot of small things that I really prefer to just shop at Kendall Star instead of everywhere else thank you very much first off um, I know there's another question uh, from you which I'll also answer in a moment but let me just address that point so uh, first off you're talking about the um, the main kind of cover it's like a plastic clear plastic like uh, it's like plastic rubbery type thing that kind of sluts on the top of the mengane that kind of helps as the mengane hits the um the top of the uh the men it kind of softens the impact really on the on the shinai so it, it does help prolong uh the life of the shinai uh and it also obviously protects the top of the men as well um yeah great uh, i'm really glad that you you enjoy using it um and you find a really good use for it that that is basically what it's used for mostly is for that sort of club practice where you know you're getting um you know those sort of repeated strikes particularly from beginners um so that's great as about the other sort of things um yeah all of those things you mentioned i i'm i'm more than happy to supply and if you email me or contact me about any of those things um or if there's something on the kendo star website if you get in touch with those I, I i'm pretty sure i can get it for you um some of this stuff's not on there just because i haven't had chance to put it on there um <laughs> uh and the, the other thing is um it's quite difficult with lots of those smaller products uh tsuba are a bit of a difficult thing because a lot of suppliers in japan that we get the tsuba from they change the designs very frequently um and it's very difficult for us to kind of keep on top of the stock control because the their, their way of um sort of supplying is is focused more around having a physical shop that people come into like you would have in japan um and then when you run out of it they just change it for a different design or something like that uh, which doesn't suit um the sort of e-commerce model that we operate um as well um so it's a little bit difficult for us to keep on top of it but um i'll definitely look into you know increasing our range of uh smaller items um obviously the other obstacle with it of course is the shipping thing because at the minute we have a policy on kendall star where every order is free shipping no matter how big or small the order is um so obviously we have to make sure that we're able to continue offering that <clears throat> um whilst offering those products um it's not really possible for us to um you know for example if we were to offer those uh sakigomu the little rubber stoppers that are on the inside of the shinai um which are very low you know like a, a very small item very low weight um but still uh we'd have to accommodate kind of accommodate for the the shipping cost of that in the pri our pricing structure of it um and it's obviously a little bit difficult for us to kind of figure out what the best way of doing that because nobody wants to pay sort of uh ten dollars for one of those things right <laughs> uh, but at the same time we can't operate at a loss um because then we'd we'd cease 
being able to do what we're able to do. So, um, yeah, let me look into it more, all right? I'll, I'll do my best to see if I can uh, improve the, the lineup of, of those sort of products, okay? Um, okay, the next question uh, comes with a bit of a short story. So, uh, as I attend and run a help, run, help, sorry, sorry, I'm not getting my words out very well. Let me have another sip of coffee here, hang on. <laughs> okay, uh, so as I attend and help run a university club, uh, we order our items as a club, especially for beginners, because the beginners are usually unwilling to part with their money. Um, so we have just bought all of the Hakama and Ghee for the beginners, but the sizing is wrong. Um, because it was bought from the cheapest place you can buy them, uh, and because students have like no money, uh, and I know you're going to say that they should just save up uh, but where their student accommodation ranges from uh, 5,500 to 9,200 uh, pounds. So you're, I, I'm guessing you're in the UK uh, for an academic year, uh, so seven months. And then we apply for a student accommodation. You either accept the offer you're given or you find somewhere else to live by yourself, which is almost impossible. Uh, and for Scottish students, uh, S-A-A-S, um, I don't know what that means. But anyway, uh, we'll give you... Um, I guess that means the, I don't know, the university size, I don't know. Anyway, then you'll get an, a maximum of uh, 6,000, uh, sorry, 7,625 in student loans. Uh, so many beginners who really can't afford good equipment. Okay, so I guess the point there is that uh, it's expensive. The, 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 uh, the amount of lo student loan you receive versus the amount you have to pay for accommodation leaves you with not very much, so they don't have much to spend on Kendall Gear. Fair enough. Uh, this is not an issue of measuring them incorrectly. Uh, I tried on what the sizes would be for me normally, and I look like a kid wearing their parents' shirt. Uh, the only thing we can do now is try and send them back and hopefully get the correct size. Uh, but my question is, how can I help Michael High get good equipment? Um, I've tried over and over again to tell them about how a good set of Kendoga will be worth the money in the long run uh, because you won't have to replace them as often, but they don't seem to listen or understand but can't afford it. Um, or they understand but can't afford it. We obviously don't push people to buy things they can't afford or really ask about anyone's financial situation and really don't know what to do. Right, okay. Uh, okay, let me summarise what I understand from that. So what you're saying is, is um, how do you balance the fact that buying the cheapest stuff out there um, comes with serious problems like you've experienced with these Hakama and Kendogi that you've bought wherever you've bought them from I'm I'm assume well I'm pretty I know that you haven't bought them from Kendo Star because I would know about that uh, I'd know about that order um, uh, I pretty much know which UK universities we supply uh, and we do supply several of them um, So yeah, how you balance the difference between um, the fact that the students have got no money uh, and also buying stuff from the cheapest place and ending up with the problem that you've got. So obviously it's very difficult, right? I understand it's difficult, it really is. But what you need to do, to be honest, is you need to get in touch with me. Um, <laughs> if you get in touch with me, I, I do have a programme, especially for like um, clubs and for universities, where if you're putting an order in as a club or as in bulk, um, where we can often work on the price for you if we're shipping everything to the same address and stuff. Um, I, there's, a, there's several UK-based universities, and not just UK, actually international universities all around the world I've, we, we, do, we, we, we work with. Um, but there's particularly several examples in the UK um, that we definitely do um, help supply, and it works very well for them, and they're... Uh, yeah, but it may be that you might be able to find cheaper prices elsewhere, um, even from the reduced prices that I am able to, to work with. Um, but then you're going to find yourself in the situation that you've got now, where obviously you've, uh, in this particular situation with your Hakaman Kendogi and they've all come in all sorts of weird sizes that they don't fit. Um, I understand that students don't have the same sort of funds um, or access to funds as people that are in their kind of uh, workforce do. Um, but that doesn't change the fact that you do really generally get what you pay for for the most part. Um, so, I'm, I'm, yeah, I mean, it, yeah, of course it's very easy for me to say, I'll oh, just save up, which to some extent, yeah, that's, that's one method. Uh, but like I say, if you can get in touch with me um, before you buy, do these sort of orders and then maybe... Maybe I can offer a price that is 
um, more affordable than just buying them individually from our website. Or maybe um, maybe there's some way we can get around it. Um, there's, you know, one of the universities that isn't so far away uh, from where I live. Um, I mean, it's not close, but one is <laughs> um, from where I actually live. Um, we supply their Kendall Club and they got together as, you know, as a, as a full club and they... they decided they wanted to order quite a lot of uh, equipment um, as, a, as a group, that is, of course. Um, individually, it didn't cost them very much, but as, as a group, it was quite a large amount of equipment. Um, and that justified me being able to actually go and therefore deliver it by hand, uh, which obviously results in me uh, being able to cut down on the delivery cost, which makes me means I'm able to offer them an even better price and make it cheaper for them. So there's all sorts of things that we can do, but I can't really help you if you don't get in touch with me first. So uh, next time you're looking for something for your university, the best thing you can do is just let you know get in touch with me and see what I can offer. Um, but yeah, I understand that your students aren't always able to afford the best stuff, but I'm not saying they should buy the best stuff, but there are cases like you've got now. So if you're gonna to have to send all this Hakama and Ken Doggy back, um, this is assuming that wherever you bought it from will accept the return. Um, and let's, you know, not only are you gonna to have to go to the effort of doing all that, <laughs> you're then gonna to have to try and figure out how to navigate whatever sizing system that, that the company you've bought it from uses so that you can get it accurate this time. You might have to pay to send it back to them. It's gonna cost you a lot more time and effort than it would have done uh, if you'd spent sort of a few pounds more on a, on a better supplier like Kendall Star. Uh, <laughs> um, so, so yeah, um, that's all I can say on that, to be honest, um, if that makes sense. So yeah, anyway, right, next one. Um, <laughs> uh, this continues in a similar theme. Uh, what up, Andy? What up? Uh, <laughs> why is Borg so expensive? What makes it so? Also, how do I measure my Hakaman key size? Uh, okay, so Borg is um, expensive in the same way that like cars are expensive or like refrigerators are expensive um, or, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, it's, it's relative to, to what you compare it to. Uh, Borg is not expensive, actually, especially considering um, what it was probably 15, 20 years ago. Um, you can get Borg extremely cheap, actually. Um, you can get it ridiculously cheap, actually, but you'll end up finding, like I just said in answer to the previous one, that if it's too cheap, it ends up costing you more in the long run. Um, it's, it, it's the price that it's at because it requires, um, uh, it requires a certain level of quality of materials. Um, that are not easily sourced, especially good quality fabric uh, from Japan. Um, it also requires a very uh, high level of skill in terms of craftsmans craftsmanship. And um, a, a large part of the bulgur, even machine stitched bulgur, is still handmade. It's made by hand. Uh, the men is put together by hand, the kode are put together by hand, uh, the tad is put together by hand, and so is the door. Um, so it. it the price is reflective, really, of the, the materials and the, the craftsmanship that's involved in it. Um, so, yeah, I don't believe it's expensive. Um, it's it's just relative, really, uh, compared to um, compared to maybe a Hakama and Kendogi, it's more expensive, yes. Uh, but obviously, considering what it is in itself, it's not, it's not expensive. Um, it can be if you want to really spend some money on it, if you want to go and throw... Um, a few thousand dollars or a few thousand pounds or euros uh, at a set of bulgur you certainly can do and what you'll get for that is a even higher grade of uh, materials higher grade of craftsmanship you can have the hand stitched so the whole thing's been stitched by hands takes uh, takes hundreds of hours just to make it you can have bamboo door with very high uh, quality lacquer finish um, you know stuff like this uh, it's it's kind of uh, that's the same as anything else, really, to be honest. Um, a good example I can think of is yesterday was my uh, my daughter's 11th birthday. <laughs> it was my daughter's 11th birthday, um, and she plays the violin. And she wanted a violin for her birthday, so I took her and bought her a violin. And um, I don't have a musical bone in my body. I've got no idea about violins, uh, but we went to the... Uh, the expert sought their advice. Uh, they showed us a range of violins, uh, starting from low price to medium price to very high 
high price. Um, and of course, there is a difference between them all. Um, you can't buy a violin for the same price you can buy a, a hamburger or a, a can of soda, but um, you know, uh, you can buy a relatively inexpensive one, just like you can with a Borg set. Uh, but uh, it, it looks to me like it, it, it reasonably depends on what you, uh, you pay um, kind of also relates to the, the quality of the fittings and stuff. And I don't know about the whole jargon and stuff, but uh, the quality of the lacquer, the varnish on it and stuff like that was what the, the dude in the shop was saying. Anyway, um, <laughs> uh, and in the end, we decided to go with a, a, um, a violin that would suit um, my daughter's, uh, not only her current level of ability, but the um, one that she would be able to use in the future because I don't want to have to replace it in a year or two's time. Um, but not one that's so ridiculously expensive um, that it's it's really um, generally used by those who are um, playing large concerts or part of large orchestras or whatever, I don't know. But, um, you know, one that would be suitable for a, a sort of intermediate to beginner level um 11 year old girl uh, that she could potentially use for several years to come um and that's how i believe um is the best approach with with borgo as well so that's what i think there in terms of um the hakamura and kendogi uh the way the best way to measure the size is uh you need to know your height um you need to know um the distance in centimeters really from your hip bone to your ankle bone um and with the and also your waist measurement with those three sizes you can generally figure out what would be the best uh size for you um and if you're in any doubt whatsoever you can email kendo star mail at kendo star.com tell us which of our products you are uh, considering purchasing and we'll uh, we'll let you know which size uh, suits you if you let us know those measurements uh, <clears throat> next one. Uh, hello, Andy. Thank you for the great. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm looking to return to Kendo after ten year hiatus. Great. Um, good to have you back. Um, the channel is among the best, preparing me for a motivated return. Good job. Um, my question is in regards to something I've noticed on on some door. Uh, one of your videos, I saw a small circular emblem in the upper left corner of the door die uh, and underneath the door money. Uh, I saw Alec Bennett with this um, similar emblem uh, on his door on NHK broadcast. What's the significance of this? Uh, is it a style of door, a marker for a brand or distinction for a certain proficiency or achievement in Kendall? I was just curious. Keep up the great work. Okay. Um, do I have one of my door around here so I can show you exactly what I'm talking about? Um, it's on the other side of the room and I don't think I should run over there and get it. But basically, um, if you watch like the Kendo Show videos and stuff, you'll see that the doll that I'm wearing has the little circular mark um, just basically uh, just under the mune in the top uh, left corner on my left uh, of the door die. What that is, is it's called a come on. Um, a come on. And it's a kind of, uh, I'm trying to look if I've got any examples around on my desk. Um, where you can see, um, it's a, no, I can't find one. It's basically a, a Japanese family crest. Um, that's exactly what it is. Um, it's, um, generally most families have one associated to them. Uh, we have a similar thing like a coat of arms in the UK, um, for many people. Let me see if I can find uh, some pictures in here actually that you'll be able to see so you can see what I'm talking about and these sort of family crests are associated to uh, yeah like I say your, your sort of family uh, and then they are um, often worn for different reasons obviously uh, in 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 history like um, people would use them for um, as clan symbols as well so the leader of a clan or a, a, a particular household that would be the mark of the entire uh, clan um, and yeah, in Kendo, we sort of carry on that tradition and that's where it is kind of traditionally uh, displayed on the Kendo armor, but sometimes in different sort of ways as well. Here's a, here's a, a, a you can see like these sort of things. Yeah. So, um, and then also there's other reasons as other ways as well recently, like not, well, when I say recently, like, I mean, in the modern era, um, like, uh, Kendo dojos may have one for their their like their specific kendo club or kendo dojo symbol, um, 
the one I have on mine is this one here. See that, it's like a fan without the sticks, that one there. That's the one that I have on mine. Uh, I have that one because that's um, that's actually the, the one associated with my wife's family. Um, and uh, her father gave me the permission to wear it on my uh, Kendall armor. He's had it on his, her brothers have it on theirs. Um, and when I was sort of accepted into the family, um, I, was, uh, I was allowed to wear it on mine as well. Um, I think the one you mentioned, Alec from, uh, from Kendall World on the NHK uh, broadcast, I think the one on his is actually the symbol from his dojo uh, back in New Zealand. Um, so yeah, that's that's basically what it is. It's it's a cosmetic thing. It doesn't symbolise rank or anything like that. It's just a it's just a, a kind of identifier of your own sort of. Um, it, well, it's kind of a way of marking it as your door. Um, but it's yeah, it, it's there's no like rules about it or anything like that. Uh, I've seen a few different ones. Some people have had it. I've seen one sometimes when it's been even smaller. Sometimes it's been in the middle of the door. Sometimes it's been uh, not just at the top, right in the middle, like where your belly button would be almost. Um, I've seen it massive on the door. I've seen all sorts of different things. So um, it's it, there's no specific hard and fast rules uh, tied to it. Uh, next, okay, uh, Andy, may I say, uh, please, obviously you speak Japanese, uh, that mixed with your accent, uh, and the speed at which you talk makes you sound almost un unintelligible. Uh, the Japanese names are just glossed over, so I cannot learn, uh, what about that? Uh, I'm in Texas, what is your rank? Uh, have you heard of a guy named, uh, Mark Grievous from NYC? Uh, he was my training partner for 30 years. Okay, um, sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> yes, I do speak Japanese. Um, I'm sorry about my accent. I'm actually trying to make my accent easier to understand. If I spoke in my original accent, I'm pretty sure like 75 to 80% of the people watching this wouldn't probably understand it if you're from outside of the UK. Um, <laughs> um, I'm trying not to talk that fast, but I am talking reasonably fast because I am a little bit conscious about how easy it is for these videos to get out of control and extremely long. Um, this one's already been going for 20 minutes and I'm only halfway through the questions. Um, so there is that. I am very sorry about that. Um, I'll do my, I'll do be I'll do, uh, my best uh, to make more effort to... Um, to pronounce the, the Japanese more clearly um, when when I use those terms, um, they're not terms though. I would be I would be clear about that. The the Japanese that we use in kendo aren't actually they're not terms or um, uh, what what can I say? They're not like well that's, yeah. I mean it's language. They're not like specific labels. Um, it's actually language, and they're actually used very. Um, differently in Japan as they are in the West as, as the, it's used like languages in that it can be very fluid and in different places they see different things for the same for the same um, exercise or same aspect of, of Kendall so uh, but that's that's just a, a small thing um, <clears throat> what was the next question uh, I'm in Texas what is my rank what is my rank um, <clears throat> my rank is uh, actually it's now sixth six Dan um, uh, which is what I was hoping to actually talk about today. Uh, I was just awarded it last weekend. Um, have I heard of a guy named uh, Mark Grievous? Uh, yes, I have heard of him, but I don't know him. I've never met him, uh, and I know almost nothing about him, uh, other than I believe he used to be on the US national team uh, way before my time. Uh, but thank you um, for the feedback. I'll do my best to be a little bit easier to understand. Um, next, I'm going to start... I'm starting a club to practice kendo. I managed to score a sweet space in the back of an Aikido dojo. Uh, so I have plenty of bokuto. In addition uh, to about half a dozen shinai and my single set of borgu. I didn't expect too many people with experience. So I need to work from the ground up. Obviously my club members are ready and willing to invest in the equipment. Uh, I have, uh, sorry, until my club members are ready to uh, invest in equipment, I have limited options. Can you or anyone recommend pot a potential curriculum that gives a good taste of what to expect in a vigorous kendo class, but makes use of limited equipment? Okay, yeah, great, no problem. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, you don't need a lot of equipment at all. You absolutely don't need a lot of equipment to get things off the ground and to get people ready to be looking at their own equipment. Um, the main thing you want to be 
focusing on. Teach them how to do the manners, okay? The manners in kendo is the most important thing, first of all, um, to teach first. So definitely teach them about that. Um, then how to do, um, these. if you go on the kendo show channel, like the first videos, I, I actually did about these things because these are the first things I would teach somebody if they were new to kendo. Um, how to do kamae, how to do sonkyo, how to do uh, the basic ash sabaki. Okay, and then I would be working mainly on Ash Sabaki for as much as I could, um, just doing one across the dojo, one step across the dojo, like this, all the way across the room, and backwards, forward and backwards, and you can do it quickly, and make sure they're shouting at the same time, so when they're going, oh, yeah, I, I have, in my club, I make them say, yeah, when they go forward, they say, to, when they go backwards, like in the kata, ya yeah, and to, they say, ya yeah, when they go forward, and to, when they go backwards, then I have them do the fast footwork, so they have to start one side of the dojo all the way to the end. Yeah, they shout yeah all the way as they do the fast suriyashi across the dojo. Um, this is actually very tiring for them. And then of course suburi and the basics of um, yeah uh, like kihon uchi, so like men waza, nice big correct men striking. Um, and yeah, kirikaishi, have them practicing kirikaishi. You can pair them up, they, one can hold the shinai, they can strike the shinai, they can block like this if they're very careful uh, to learn the basics of kirikaishi and then work them up so that they're able, as far as being able to do kirikaishi with fumikomi, uh, and if you can get them as far as doing that, um, then, then you can start talking to them about um, investing in more equipment. Uh, but I think if you do that sort of thing, I think it would also be quite vigorous, uh, quite tiring, uh, but also um, keep them um, focused on the basics. Uh, <clears throat> next one. Hi, Andy. First of all, congratulations. <laughs> very inspiring, Shinsa. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. <laughs> um, attending this weekend seminar, I'd like to hear your view on the issue that was faced by many students with getting in line properly. How come we just can't seem to align properly? It's not so hard and doesn't require a, lack of uh, a lot of technique. So for people with years of experience, it's frustrating to watch. Lack of enforcement in the door jaw, um, question mark. Thanks. Okay, so <clears throat> at the seminar at the weekend, obviously you were in attendance. Um, the three senseis from Japan uh, were Higashi Sensei from uh, Aichi Prefecture. We had uh, Kasamura Sensei from uh, Kanagawa Prefecture. And we also had Kawahara Sensei from Hyogo. Um, so, um, yeah, one of the things that they were most frustrated about whilst teaching the seminar is that they, they felt very frustrated how it wasn't natural, not natural, but like instinctive for the people there to line up straight and uh, not just like when you do the start of the the class and you start and you sit down and do mokuso and rei and all that, not just then, then as well, but also when you do kamae and both people do the kamae and they do the starting position. Most people were starting from the very close distance and um, as the sensei would look down the room, everybody was sort of staggered instead of two straight lines. Um, and uh, even though on the first day, the sensei told us about this uh, quite early on, throughout the day, they had to keep reminding everybody at the seminar to do this. And they found that very frustrating. Uh, so I understand your question is, is, why is, why is this something that people struggle with? Um, when it doesn't seem to be something difficult and absolutely right. It's not difficult. It's very very easy And I think you're absolutely correct. It is lack of enforcement in the dojo and I went back to my dojo um, on Monday and uh, I took this and Yeah, because I, I realized that this was something that was caused at the dojo level This is something as, as kendo instructors. We have to instill as habit um, it has to be something because at the moment it seemed to me that most of the people there were just moving um, without much thought to the center line because that isn't something that you've always got in the forefront of your mind and it's not something that you necessarily will. So uh, it's important for us as instructors to um, kind of force, not force, but enforce, <laughs> enforce these rules. Um, 
or these practices so that they become habitual to the students so that wherever they go they automatically do so without thinking so that means that they're lining up straight uh, when it's the start of class and they're lining up they line up straight not just sideways so the people next to them are in a straight line but also behind them if they've got more than one line then the lines should be straight uh, in both directions it shouldn't be sort of staggered, staggered like this. So if there's somebody behind you, they should be directly behind you. Uh, there shouldn't be people in between, uh, for example. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's the responsibility of the dojos and particularly the instructors. And we, we have to do a better job of enforcing that. Okay, last one. Uh, I have a question about the use of an obi in kendo. Uh, I've recently started practicing again, and my sensei prefers everybody to wear an obi. I was wondering how common uh, this is, and um, when I visit other dojos, should I not wear it, or does it not really matter? Does kendo style plan on selling obi in the future? Okay, so this is another product probably I should add. Um, I don't. I haven't added it because it's not been at the forefront of my mind because I don't personally use one. Um, but I, I certainly will um, if, if there's a demand for them. I'm sure there are. Um, yeah, it, it, it doesn't matter. If you want to wear an OB, um, then wear an OB. If you go to a different club, it doesn't matter. You can still wear it. No one's going to say, hey, get that OB off. <laughs> um, it's, yeah, it's fine to wear the OB. Um, it's, uh, how common is it? I'd say, like, reasonably common. Um, most people don't, but it's not uncommon to wear it. Um, there's plenty of people that certainly do. Um, that's probably what I would say about that. Um, but yeah, other than that, I'll I'll do my best to get uh, OB up on Kendall Star as soon as I can. I'll add it to the list of things <laughs> that need adding. Okay. Um, so I hope that sort of answers the questions. Uh, let me have another sip of coffee before I talk about the weekend. <laughs> Um, I'll try not to uh, linger on it too much, but basically um, what I wanted to talk about, there's loads of stuff actually um, that I took away from the weekend seminar uh, in Paris. It was the European Kendall Federation uh, seminar held in Paris over the weekend uh, with those three teachers that I mentioned just before. Uh, three very, very accomplished teachers, uh, very famous teachers actually. Um, and uh, I felt very, very lucky to be able to receive their teachings. Um, and yeah, I'll probably talk a bit about what they taught at the seminar in future videos. Uh, but what I think I'd like to talk about right now, um, while it's still fresh in my mind, uh, I haven't sort of sat down and planned this, which I probably should have done. Um, <laughs> um, but basically, I was able to, uh, yeah, uh, sit my exam for sixth, sixth dan. Um, and I was, I was successful, um, which was... Uh, fantastic for me. <laughs> uh, I'm very grateful to everybody um, who's helped me along the way. Uh, it certainly isn't an achievement um, of just myself. I didn't do it on my own. Um, it's thanks to everybody that's ever crossed Chennai with me up until now. And not just that, people that I've talked to, even everybody here watching uh, these videos. Uh, these videos have also helped me uh, progress to a level where I was able to do that. Um, I've said before in these videos that um, there's you know, uh, there's been times when some of the questions that I've asked have made me re uh, have been asked. Sorry, have, have sort of forced me to rethink a lot of things and maybe think about things on a deeper level or um, research things a little bit more. Uh, and that's obviously improved my own understanding and uh, practice of Kendall uh, very much as well. So uh, thank you uh, to everyone um, who's who's sort of involved in this um, this channel as well because that's also been an important step. Um, what I'd like to sort of mention is, um, it was very, uh, very interesting experience to test for, for Sixth Dan, um, and the results were very different to what I had imagined. There was, there was a lot of, um, a lot of people testing actually, it was somewhere between 30 and 40, um, I think it was like 35, 30, 30 something anyway, um, and uh, there was f five people that uh, were awarded the grade. Um, and, uh, yeah, um, I, if I was to phrase it in any way, I think what I think I should probably talk about is how, how did I pass? Um, because that's probably what I've been asked for the most. Um, I will address right now is several people have asked me to post the videos of the grading. Um, I do have videos of my Tatiai, my grading, uh, but I will not be posting them publicly because um, 
I don't think that it's appropriate for me to do so, uh, to be honest, because um, they're not just videos of me, there's other people in them as well. Um, yeah, I, 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 I'm sorry, but I won't be post. I will not be posting those publicly. Um, someone else may have them, and they may do so though. Uh, <laughs> that's up to them. Um, the uh, yeah, how did I do it? Well, um, it was it was my first attempt, so I wasn't actually super comp confident that I would pass. I know that sixth dan or Rokudan is a, a quite a difficult barrier to get over from fifth dan, um, but I think. I was I was feeling very uh well I was not feeling very confident shall we say uh until the night before the grading actually um and I I wouldn't say that I suddenly felt more confident but I decided the night before I was um I was uh I was trying to sleep and not doing a very good job of it because I was r rather nervous um and I sort of decided to myself and I, I sort of thought about everything that I've been told in the past and particularly the things that the senseis have talked about over the set course of the seminar and um yeah I think one of the things that was most important I thought for myself to show in the sixth dan exam um and I think this isn't just for sixth dan I think this is for sort of lower grades as well fifth dan um and probably fourth dan as well um is Kendall, as I've said before, Kendall can't be um, performed on your own. Of course you can do Sabidi, but um, a Kendall Tatiai isn't just about yourself. So um, the worst thing I think you can do in the grading is just act um, on your own uh, volition or your own, um, act out your own um, intentions with no regard for your opponent whatsoever. Um, or a partner is probably a better word than an opponent even, but um, with no regard for it whatsoever. So, oh, I want to hit men, so I'll just attack men. Okay, next I want to hit Kote, so I'll just attack Kote. Um, and, yeah, that you, you can't... It's not a good idea to do that, because that isn't how Kendo is supposed to work. Um, instead, what I decided was um, I knew who my partners would be for the grading exam because uh, they were also in attendance at the seminar they were both people that I knew uh, reasonably well um, uh, or they were also members of other national teams um, of around the same sort of age same sort of experience um, so yeah I was I was quite happy to learn it was those uh, people because I knew that they also had very uh, nice uh, beautiful kendo as well and um, so hopefully we'll be able to do the beautiful um, and enjoyable uh, keiko together um, and I just thought to myself well whatever happens whatever happens I would uh, make sure that I was the person to take the sen okay the sen so you might have heard of the concept of sen um, we have the mitsu no sen is um, a phrase in kendo there is in other martial arts too um so you have a uh, sen no sen 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 no sen and go no sen uh, but not i don't mean sen in that specific context i guess in this way it means the initiative so i thought to myself there was a few things that i needed to absolutely achieve um in my two minutes because that's all you get one minute with each person um I had to achieve, well, I was determined to achieve uh, these few sort of things. And one of them was I would definitely be the person to take the scent, take the initiative. Okay, so what that would mean in a physical manner is not only from a ment mental point of view, but everything starts from the far distance, from the, t the tall man. Okay, from the far distance with my pens here. Yeah, and both of you start to um, produce the ki with the shouting, yeah, yeah, like this, <laughs> okay? And then, at some point, you start to gradually kind of come together, I guess, but at some point, somebody is gonna take the initiative, and I was gonna make sure that was me. So I was gonna be the one that took this initiative, okay? And took this half step in, or was the one that was gonna take that initiative before anything happened. And I thought, whatever happens, that's gonna be me. I'm gonna be the one that decides when something happens. Um, 
and in that way I can keep control of the bout. If I'm hit or if my techniques fail, uh, that's okay, it's not ideal. <laughs> um, but if nothing else, I must be the one to take, take that initiative. I will be the one that controls the situation. Um, and I was able to do that throughout both of my matches, generally, um, which is one of the reasons I believe I was successful. Um, secondly, I decided that I would also um, attack with complete confidence and stemi, okay, uh, and with all of my energy. So uh, I'd felt from the day before there had been a few times that I had practiced uh, we'd done some jigeko with the other participants of the seminar um, and basically um, I found that many of my attacks were not, uh, even though I felt they were at opportune moments, uh, they were not connecting as I would like them to and um, I was starting to feel, it, it, on, it, sorry in retrospect really I think is the best way to phrase this, in retrospect I kind of identified that uh, I was not 100% confident with my waza before initiating my attacks during those, during those keiko. Um, partly was because I was nervous, partly was because I wanted them to be so uh, successful so much that it, it made me nervous. Um, I was, it was one of the sicknesses of, in Kendo, of Kendall, really. I was, I was afraid um, that it wouldn't be uh, successful, uh, so I lost confidence in, um, in my attack. Um, and in contrast to that, what I decided to do is um, I made sure that throughout the, the Shido Geiko, where the senseis would stand as motodachi for the Keiko, I would absolutely make sure that I go and practice with them. And uh, Higashi Sensei especially um, was kind enough to uh, receive the uh, Kakarigeko for me at the end of our keiko, he was kind enough to uh, initiate the Kakarigeko for me, uh, which is exactly what I needed at the time as well, um, because then I was able to just throw everything, uh, throw everything away, and I tried to carry that feeling uh, into my waza uh, that I uh, would perform in my uh, in my exam. So I would be the one that takes the initiative. Yeah. Ha! I would be the one that takes this initiative. And then when it's time for me to go, with everything, with everything, I would leave nothing behind, no feeling of anything left. Um, uh, that would be uh, the other thing that I wanted to ensure that I, um, I definitely did um, in, my, in my attacks. And... Uh, yeah, I guess, I guess finally I would do my best to um, eliminate any um, kind of, um, what can I say, um, kind of cares or worries about being struck or being unsuccessful. Um, I expected that I would receive the kaishido or the nukido at least once or twice throughout the shinsa um, especially as I knew that my men attack would likely be somewhat um, anticipated um, but I decided that instead of trying to work around that I would uh, commit to my attack anyway and um, I, am, I, I went in with the um, with the attitude that I am going to attack you with my best men, my best men. And if you strike my doll, or you do the nuki doll, the kaishi doll, uh, that's okay uh, because this is my best men and I will definitely succeed. Uh, and as I expected, I think I received two uh, kaishido or nukido during, the, during both bouts. Um, I also performed one. Um, but even so, uh, the one, the, when I performed the, the ojiwaza, the kaishido, I think I did kaishido twice, um, which I, I didn't expect myself to do. <laughs> um, but uh, 
even then, it wasn't that he came and attacked my men, so I did the Kaishi Dol. Instead, from here, there was a bit of a bit of a thing here, and then I stepped in and he attacked my men. I stepped in, I took the initiative, he attacked my men, and I took the door. Um, so I think these were the things that helped me to uh, achieve uh, the success in the exam. Um, these are the things that I had been taught by many of my teachers. Um, and these are the things that the teachers at the seminar had talked about also. Um, so yeah, it's not really like a, it's not like a secret hint or something like that, but I think it's something that's so important for that. There were many people, for example, in the grading that scored lots of hits. They made lots of what would really be considered yuko datotsu, uh, valid strikes, but still they weren't able to achieve uh, success in the grading, uh, probably because of the, the, the way in which those strikes were achieved um, weren't necessarily through something that they brought, around, brought about themselves. Um, so yeah, uh, that, was the, that was my mindset going into it. Uh, it turned out that it was the correct one, um, it seems. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I would urge anybody that's going for gradings, whether it's for sixth dan or for fifth dan or for fourth dan, um, I think you need to think about these things as well when you're going for the, um, for that level of, of, of grading. Uh, okay. Uh, you have to take the initiative and you have to attack with STEMI and with confidence. Um, and if you're able to do this, then I, I believe you'll be, be successful. Um, once again, thank you very much um, to everybody that's supported me up to now um, and has allowed me to, to progress uh, to where I am. Um, it's not like, uh, wow, suddenly I've got the sixth and I'm something different. I'm not. I'm the same person that I was last week. Um, I have the same ability that I had last week. I haven't suddenly got any better. Um, but I do appreciate that uh, I have been helped along the road this far by everybody. Um, I'm going to end there because this has really been probably the longest video I've ever done. Uh, congratulations for watching if you got this far because <laughs> it has been something of a dragon video. Sorry about that. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed it though if you've managed to get this far into it. Uh, don't forget to like, share, subscribe and all that sort of thing. Um, get in the Kendo Show Early Access group. Some of the questions were from there. I forgot to mention it before uh, but there's a link in the description. It's free to join. Um, it's where a lot of the videos get posted before anywhere else and it's a great place to ask you questions because it, it's kind of a forum of discussion really um don't forget to shop at kendo star and if you didn't know already <laughs> uh, it's the but it's the best place to shop for loads of reasons um not just uh that i own it but also because the gear is really good uh the prices are good um and it's really good service so yeah kendostar.com uh thanks a lot for watching and i'll uh, i'll see you all next time